Good day. I want to welcome everyone to today's Association for Learning Environments webinar, Makerspaces from Elementary Schools to College Campuses. Our speakers today are Gwen Morgan and Allison Schneider from Stantec. An interior designer with more than 10 years of experience, Gwen is Stantec's discipline leader for interior design and leader in the company's research and benchmarking group that recently examined Makerspaces as a component of modern education. Allison is a senior interior designer who shapes user experiences through concept-driven design, space planning, sustainability, graphics, and material selection. She specializes in education design, particularly K-12, through and channels the curiosity of her inner child to design spaces to be fun, functional, and simulating. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to our speakers, and thank you so much for joining us for today's program. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar, and special thanks to A4LE as well for organizing this series and helping to keep us all connected during this time. Uh, this course is registered with AIA, um, and I believe Matt will go over a little more detail at the end on that as far as certificates. As far as our learning objectives today, uh, we are going to go over the origins of makerspaces. We're going to start to differentiate and categorize a few different types, which will help you in designing based on client and program needs, as well as highlight a handful of case studies um, supporting each of these categories. Finally, we will do a deep dive into one particular project and then forecast the future of makerspaces as they adapt to our changing culture. Uh, so my name is Allison Schneider. As Matt said, I'm a senior interior designer in Stantex Austin, Texas office. I've uh, been in the education design field for about 10 years and am part of um, Stantec has several research and benchmarking groups. Um, so one group that we're a part of focuses on interior environments, and we specifically took on the recent project of studying makerspaces in more depth, and that is what we want to share with you today. So I'll pass it over to Gwen. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gwen Morgan. Um, I'm a principal um, and interior designer at Stantec, and I'm also the discipline leader for our interior design um, at, at a, a firm-wide level. Um, and I, I lead the research and benchmarking team for uh, furniture in the interior environments that Ali spoke about. So we look forward to sharing with you today. So let's start, um, first of all, by talking just a little bit about uh, makerspaces and kind of where um, this started as a trend. Um, as you guys know, makerspaces are, are not really a new idea. Um, this picture you see on the screen um, is of Thomas Edison's lab at uh, Menlo Park, New Jersey, um, which his father actually built. Um, he had a number of other spaces adjacent to this lab, including um, a glass house, a carpenter shop, um, a carbon shed, a blacksmith shop. Um, and this was really kind of one of the earliest examples um, in this country of uh, a research and development facility. So um, it was here that Edison you know, worked on developing the telephone. Um, he also experimented with the idea of recording the sound of human voice. Um, so, uh, and this was around um, 1876, so late 1800s. We also see uh, makerspaces in libraries around this time, too, um, in both the United States and Canada, offering um, crafting, sewing, quilting, uh, things like that. So makerspaces um, are, are really not new, um, but let's talk a little bit about why um, the trend has really made this recent um, reemergence. Um, and we really see a number of factors kind of coming together here at the same time. Um, Make Magazine, uh, which is largely considered to be kind of the makerspace bible, um, was first published in 2005 um, and continues to be published um, today. Um, and coincidentally, or maybe not, <laughs> that's the first uh, year that Etsy was founded. Um, MIT also began their Fab Lab program um, with the class How to Make Almost Anything um, in the early 2000s. Um, with the economy crash in 2008, um, we definitely see in society this shift towards more budget-friendly, uh, do-it-yourself solutions, 
um, as people are kind of tightening their belts and their budgets um, around their work. And around the same time, um, technology makes this really significant evolutionary shift forward with touchscreen phones and tablets um, becoming much more commonplace. So in the world of education, uh, this then leads us to this discussion about uh, knowledge acquisition, um, the value of memorizing facts when information is so accessible um, through these tools. And um, this discussion, as you all know, um, went a number of different directions um, in the educational design world and has a lot of different implications. Um, but one result um, was this renewed emphasis on um, things that iPads couldn't do for you, like invent a prototype um, and figure out how to construct it. Um, we also see that libraries, um, which for a long time were repositories of printed material, um, really began to question their own identity and embraced maker spaces as a way to really engage uh, the community's interest in making. Uh, so the movement in general is really well summarized in this book, um, Mark Hatch's Maker uh, Manifesto. So Mark was the founder of one of the more popular and well-known maker spaces um, called Tech Shop. And uh, these words on the screen are some of his action words for why, um, for what people do in maker spaces um, and why it matters. So he talks about how making is really fundamental to being human. Um, that learning is a part of the process and that there's always more to learn about making um, new techniques, new materials, new processes, um, and that now is really an interesting uh, time for makerspaces um, because tools um, have never been cheaper, easier to use, um, or more powerful um, than they are today. Um, he also talks about makerspaces as a way for um, the community to participate in making all together. Um, either by holding seminars, um, parties, events, fairs for other makers, and how this really becomes an agent of change uh, for the community. In the world of education, um, we see that this trend also really took off um, because it filled a particular gap that had been noticeable for some time. Um, so we've seen in the past um, plenty of teaching methodology, focused on visual and aural learners, um, and options for kinesthetic learners, um, for those who learn through more physical activity, um, were actually relatively few. So makerspace has really become a way for them to um, engage in that opportunity. So when we look at some of the overall goals for uh, modern education, um, these are some of the characteristics that we often hear from our clients um, that are important, and makerspaces in an educational setting can really be a strong practice arena for students to um, work on these skills. Um, but what's even more interesting, we think, um, is to compare these to what employers um, are saying they want from employees in a modern work environment. Um, and you can see here there's a lot of overlap in terms of um, what these, um, what educators are looking to provide and what um, employees are, or employers are looking for um, in their employees. And when we look at school and office design um, from 50 years ago or more, um, it's clear that education and workplace have been informing one another for a, a really long time. So, um, you know, the environment on the left is a great um, preparation for the environment on the right. Um, information delivered to rows of desks um, really coordinates with um, the style of workspaces that we saw um, many years ago. Um, so when we fast forward to some of the designs that we see for these spaces today, um, we see that maker spaces can really support the mutual goals of both education and workplace environments and that they can be found in both um, and that both range in their approach from something um, much more uh, dirty and industrial to something more abstract and focused on innovative thought. 
Um, but because there is this range, um, we've really noted um, in our research some different um, examples that we'd like to use as spot starters to share with you. So I'm going to hand it back over to Allie, who's going to talk a little bit about um, our research. All right, so this question, what do you mean by makerspace? And then we have an image of a 3D printer, which I think is what comes to mind for a lot of people. Um, we've seen an increasing trend from school districts asking for makerspaces over the last several years. Um, but we've found that when we dig a little bit deeper and trying to get more information on the type of program and curriculum that they want out of that space, we found that a lot of people were actually interested in the idea um, but didn't really know um, beyond uh, a 3D printer necessarily um, what they actually wanted out of it. So our group um, kind of took it upon ourselves to help define that. Um, so makerspaces can take many shapes and forms. And so what we decided to do was compile our own makerspace projects first, um, evaluate them based on what we've seen and what we've designed. And then secondly, we took a number of benchmarking trips around the US um, as part of our research and benchmarking group and saw where other people were having successes um, in different parts of the country so that we could help guide our clients towards a design solution that would best fit. So this map is showing a few of the places that we targeted um, as kind of hubs with um, either a high concentration or um, highly advertised maker spaces that seem to be pretty popular. Um, so we sent out some groups to visit these and tour these, and you can see a small list on the left of the places that we visited. Um, you'll notice that a lot of them are, you know, it's a, a mix of K-12, higher ed, public spaces, and then we tried to hit a few different regions as well so we weren't getting um, kind of skewed regionalized data um, either. We know this is a lot of information and we definitely don't expect you to be able to read it all, um, but we just wanted to show you kind of the, what we gathered um, at each location that we visited. Um, so we asked questions on our tours um, as far as how the space was being used, the courses that were taught there, how the staff worked with the group, um, the types of equipment, the size of the space, the types of tools that they used, um, and then obviously took a lot of photos as well. And so that helped us to kind of boil it down based on after we, we took all these trips, we did all of our own benchmarking of our own projects and um, kind of created these four main categories that we would like to, um, to start to summarize some of the trends that we found and share some examples of each in the hopes that you will have a better way to differentiate makerspace um, expectations and needs uh, as you design them. All right, so the first example uh, that we'd like to dive into is what we're calling um, a discovery lab. A discovery lab um, supports short-term or spontaneous projects. Um, oftentimes, these spaces may be lower tech than some of the examples that we will share with you later. Um, they're very lively, vibrant, um, small-scale spaces that are really designed to excite the creativity of users just as soon as they enter the room. So you may see um, shelves and storage bins, um, house, housing supplies for crafting uh, materials or artistic creations. Um, in some cases, the contents of the uh, makerspace might be housed on a cart even that travels um, from room to room if a permanent space um, isn't really available. So some places that we saw these um, types of maker spaces were most commonly in elementary schools, um, sometimes museums or libraries, um, and all of them offered um, lots of opportunities um, to display um, work that had been completed there. So we wanted to share just a few examples with you guys of each type. Um, and these are a combination of um, Stantec projects and projects that we saw on our uh, benchmarking tours, um, which if you remember were a combination of, of our projects and projects done by others. Um, so for the projects um, that we worked on, we put our little Stantec logo down in the bottom corner, um, and for projects by others, we did not. So um, we just wanted to clarify that for you as we go through um, some of these spaces. Uh, so this first example 
Um, many of you may have heard of. This is Stanford's uh, D School, which was one of the early pioneers of uh, Makerspace Studios. Um, and it's featured uh, pretty prominently in the book Makespace, um, which has been a conversation starter for a lot of people interested um, in Makerspaces. Um, and while the majority of the D School is much more technical um, than what you're seeing here, this particular space um, is subdivided to be a K-12 studio where groups of um, K-12 students are invited in uh, to do workshops. The K-12 studio um, is really a thought starter space to um, inspire younger students or sometimes K-12 staff to really be creative um, and explore the value of making. They offer partnerships, um, lots of training uh, modules. Um, they also have this really interesting methodology um, whereby they would sort of retrofit and change the space um, by adding partitions to this post and beam system that they had um, in the building. Uh, this next example is from uh, North Stafford High School, um, which recently um, undertook a pretty major upgrade to its entire library. Um, and we took uh, polls of students to really determine what features they found to be most useful um, in their current library, um, and then designed the renovated space to really emphasize or enlarge those areas. Um, so the students uh, told us in the surveys that they really came to the library for computer access, to socialize, to study research and ideas. Um, and one of the concepts that came up um, was actually the makerspace. So uh, this makerspace uh, was formerly uh, the traditional computer lab um, that we oftentimes see associated um, adjacent to libraries. And uh, this makerspace really allows students to express ideas and concepts through a pretty broad choice of media um, and is a place for them to engage in all the activities that they indicated in that survey um, was important to them. So computer and technology use, um, working with their fellow students and groups, um, researching and doing independent study. Um, one thing that the staff mentioned was really helpful in this particular uh, makerspace, um, you can see that underneath the counter, um, and for a lot of the storage solutions in this room, it's either um, open shelving or cabinets with kind of clear doors on them. And they emphasize that having um, the visibility to see the supplies and tools that were there um, really increased their use. So um, this school really found a lot of success um, in showcasing uh, the materials that were available. Um, and this shows some of the other supporting spaces from the library, um, which still does have a traditional book collection, um, and also has um, these smaller collaborative uh, spaces for students to study alone. Um, this is the Pew Library at Grand Valley State University. Um, which really took um, an, a really innovative approach to the modern library. Uh, book storage um, was consolidated into a very small portion of the library, and a machine is used to retrieve books. Um, and that's what you're seeing on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. So this really freed up um, an enormous amount of space to devote to um, places for tutoring, places for students to meet, um, working on projects, um, and of course, um, a small uh, makerspace. So this makerspace um, is uh, in our discovery lab style, um, and it's more like an open showroom kind of a setup. So the lab is open to all students, um, but it can be reserved at times for specific courses um, like computer engineering, uh, marketing, video game design, uh, VR, and product design. So the lab is run by trained students um, and one faculty member. Um, some of the equipment available for use includes um, a VR experience, a 360 camera, um, 2D and 3D printers, a Spherio 2.0 programming game and tool, and an Ozobot robot as well. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the other things that we saw in this style of makerspaces, just some uh, uh, in other styles of the discovery lab, rather, which was just some really uh, creative ways to allow students 
um, to kind of spontaneously interact with objects, like um, the Lego wall that you see there um, on the left that kind of offers all the parts and pieces you need to kind of spontaneously uh, build. So some of the projects that we saw um, being created in these types um, were things like uh, rubber band racers, um, straw rocket shooters, um, basic weather stations, um, spin art, some musical instruments. Um, so a lot of different interesting uh, projects there. Um, we also saw, um, in some cases, um, that there would be, if there wasn't a dedicated space in the school for a makerspace, but they still wanted to offer that opportunity, um, they would include some kind of a mobile cart solution, um, like this uh, Teacher Geek Maker Cart that we're showing here on the right. Um, so um, this is a way that you can kind of house all of those tools in a consolidated way and move it around from room to room um, instead of moving the students um, to a particular place in the building. Um, another example um, was, is uh, Stratasys, um, which is really just a, a large bus, if you will, that houses a lot of different uh, technology options. Um, and it travels around uh, the country to different locations. And it's kind of a way to just showcase um, different technology pieces that are available. And with that, um, let me turn it back to Ali to talk about our second type. All right, so a fabrication lab um, is kind of a step up as far as the robust type of equipment that you'll find um, compared to a discovery lab. Um, so its primary function is typically academic support at a secondary or higher education facility, although it might be open to students outside of class times and not necessarily associated with a course. Um, but oftentimes it does, it does support specific coursework, um, or it might be integrated, we've seen a lot of times as part of a career and technology program or a vocational building, um, kind of as support for those spaces. Um, and oftentimes these will have dedicated staff, um, which is a little bit different than the Discovery Lab um, sometimes. Um, and it might also partner, especially at the higher ed level, with a local business um, for additional support and kind of that community connection, um, which is always helpful. Um, the equipment is generally a little bit more advanced. Um, sometimes it will require training, um, usually designed to support semester-long projects. So uh, project storage becomes actually a really key component for these types of maker spaces. Um, some examples of equipment that you'd find might include a 3D printer, a laser cutter, CNC router, sewing station. We, um, we've even seen vinyl cutters, jewelry, ceramics, uh, paint booths, and vacuum molding as a few examples. Um, so this example is from uh, Maynard New Tech Middle School. And um, as the name kind of implies for a fab lab, gets more into building with equipment. So knowing the type of equipment will help shape what you need to, how you need to design uh, your fabrication lab. So some equipment will actually warrant its own room for exhaust um, or to isolate noise. So you can see that in this view on the left, um, there's a door, um, a storefront door with some windows um, that, that houses its own equipment. Um, these are often located in middle schools and high schools and public access as well. And they all, depending on the type, um, they all kind of have unique scheduling and space needs as well. Um, Fab Lab tasks can range from small scale industrial type design, like uh, for instance, a fidget spinner, um, to more large scale uh, robotics competition type things or solar powered cars. Um, so since Fab Labs can kind of support a wide range of projects and sizes, the availability of power is really key, as well as storage. Um, so you can see in this picture, um, we have some overhead power reels that come down from the ceiling, um, which is a great solution for accessibility, especially um, when you're working with either an existing building where you can't add floor cores or you don't have as much power as you might like. Um, additionally, outdoor access for a fab lab is really critical. So you can see um, there's a, an overhead garage door that goes to the outside um, and actually one in the foreground that goes to a big three-story space on the inside. So they can easily transport projects around 
Um, um, also a big benefit to having an adjacent classroom in the fab lab um, for when group training is required or um, if a team wants to present a project, um, as well as separate storage areas um, for bigger items like metal and wood, um, which also helps to control access, especially in a K-12 setting. So this is one example from one of our tours um, that was at UNC Hill Library. Um, so about 25% of the time at this one, it's used by students in conjunction with a course. Um, but the other 75% of the time, it's students or staff um, who are actually using it just kind of on their own um, individually. So anyone with a UNC ID can actually use this space, but they are required to take first take a safety course. And it's kind of come and go, no appointments necessary, except um, I believe they, they schedule the laser cutter in particular, um, just because that's a little higher demand. And they have one staff member that is employed by the library and runs the space, which is funded by student fees. Um, some other photos from the UNC Hill Library. Um, there's a display case you can see in the photo on the left, which features student work. And since it's associated um, adjacent to the library, it's kind of a way for them to advertise, which is nice um, for students passing by. Um, equipment includes laptops, 3D printers, sewing machines, um, soldering equipment, 3D scanners, laser, and vinyl cutters. Um, you can also see some exhaust arms are required because of soldering, um, which is also recommended for 3D printers. Um, they also employed the overhead power and pegboards and cabinets for supply storage and project storage. Um, next, we have the Bray Lab at Tufts University. This one, um, actually at Tufts University, they have several maker spaces. Um, this is just one example that was part of their Department of Mechanical Engineering, which is one large shop in a few lighter labs. It was originally a resource for several classes, including mechanical, civil, biomed engineering, and design. But they have since opened it up as a resource for the whole campus. Um, and it's funded by alumni donations and department funding. Also on Tufts University, this is a little bit in contrast to the previous one. Um, this is the CRISP Signal Processing Robotics and Structures Lab, which was a large flexible space um, really only used by the human-centered engineering group and used as part of their curriculum. So rather than kind of that come and go model um, of the previous one. Um, so they had a workspace with a multitude of storage options and places to plug in. And then we wanted to look at um, the K-12 level. Um, this is Plano STEAM in Plano, Texas. Um, so it actually was a renovation to a three-story uh, call center that actually sat abandoned for several years before it was converted into this uh, STEAM Academy for high school students. The majority was kept open, um, so it kind of pays homage back to its call center days, um, but furniture was used to creatively divide up the space as needed, and um, only rooms that needed to be enclosed were actually enclosed, so it was very flexible. Their curriculum at Plano STEAM was um, project-based learning, so the school uses their fabrication lab to support um, several of their projects that the students have going on, um, and it includes a welding booth, a laser cutter, a sawmill, um, among a lot of other equipment. And they have a strong partnership with Texas Instruments, which also has a campus in Plano. Um, and additionally, it helps supports, support their robotics, um, robotics club. Um, so some other examples on our tours that we saw um, that we thought were um, just kind of some interesting design features and little details. Um, so the one on the left is how to reset the space that we saw at a Stanford tour. Um, which is kind of nice when you have a lot of different groups using the same space um, to keep it organized, um, making sure that it's not um, left in disarray for the next group, um, and just to kind of maintain some order. Um, the middle image is from Columbia College, which was my favorite example of, of tool organization. So they had kind of this checkout counter um, and somebody who worked behind the counter. You could see all the images of the tools that they had available to rent. 
Um, so somebody um, that was staffed was actually responsible for organizing it. Um, so it wasn't just kind of a, a take what you need and put it back situation, um, which kept them very organized. Um, and then we also saw just the third image, um, just lots of marker surface, chalkboard surface, just ways to keep the ideas flowing, um, which is always nice for maker spaces as well. Now back to Gwen for type three. If I remember to unmute myself, that would help. <laughs> um, thank you, Ali. Um, our third type uh, that we found, um, we're calling more of an, an industrial or a manufacturing solution. So some of the maker spaces that we saw are designed for much more um, robust um, industrial projects. So oftentimes these were housed by um, larger scale companies for the purposes of prototyping or product developing. Um, but I think what makes it uh, relevant to this conversation is that they oftentimes um, partner with the community and offer um, hours for outside uh, parties to come in and make use of their space. Um, that said, the equipment in some of these spaces is often quite large, um, very specific, very expensive, um, and sometimes requires really specific training um, or safety protection uh, while, it's, uh, while operating. Uh, the machinery. Uh, so one example um, that we saw is uh, M-Hub, which is in Chicago. Um, and this is a 63,000 square foot converted Motorola factory um, that offers space for, um, quote, inventors, makers, and risk takers in Chicago. So this space was focused on um, physical product development and manufacturing. And it was really begun as a response to Chicago kind of falling behind um, on patents per capita um, in their city. So the center um, offers monthly memberships, um, and it's been used for projects like uh, pancreas pumps, just as one example. Um, so there are some garages that are used for lab space, um, as well as rooms with butcher block tables for additional workspace. Um, there's machines for plastic bending, sandblasting, um, injection molding, um, things of that nature. We were also really fortunate um, to tour um, not one but two of Autodesk's uh, maker spaces, uh, one in San Francisco and one in uh, Boston. Um, and uh, the one in uh, San Francisco, located at Pier 9, um, is really a center for design and digital manufacturing. Um, so community partners can use this space as well. Um, it's really designed to push the boundaries of design and digital manufacturing. And people from all over Autodesk, um, as well as the community, come here to kind of explore and learn more. Um, and they even have, um, across the street um, from this facility, um, they have a museum space that showcases kind of all the things that um, Autodesk or people using their space um, have helped to innovate um, and create. So um, equipment training is required here. Um, people come from uh, different disciplines and different industries um, to explore what they can make um, in their own space. They also have a summer internship program where anyone can apply and be accepted, and they shared with us that the, the oldest intern they ever had was 85 years old um, who joined them to learn about making. Um, I thought that the solution you see here on the screen was really interesting. Um, they have uh, these large bays um, with garage doors for exterior access, um, and you can see they've got these taller, clear divider panels, and what's great about that is they can use those to kind of subdivide the space as needed, depending on um, who is using the space for a project at any given time. So within this space, you could have you know, four smaller teams working on smaller projects, um, or you could open up those partitions to form kind of one larger connected uh, space um, if you had something uh, much bigger going on. Um, one thing that was uh, critical, especially in these more industrial spaces, um, is the idea of dividing quiet and loud spaces from each other, um, especially when you've got these uh, really robust machines that can be quite noisy. Um, so oftentimes we would see these sort of separated labs, um, either for kind of smaller workspace or sometimes um, computer labs, 
um, if the computers had specific design programs loaded on them um, that would complement the machines that were next door. Um, and acoustic separation was pretty critical um, in those spaces. Um, we oftentimes would see separate storage rooms here for supplies, um, depending on how the space is used. Um, a lot of times in these spaces, um, the, the people using the space were required to provide their own materials, um, as opposed to some of the previous types where the materials were often just um, stocked and on hand and available. And of course, that has to do with the specialization of these types of, of spaces. It would be almost um, impossible to predict um, all the materials that could be needed um, for projects taking place um, in these spaces. Uh, we also saw that some of these facilities would offer um, office space for local businesses um, to hold mentoring office hours um, for students who are using the space or community members who are um, exper uh, experimenting. Um, and so the office space could also be rented um, by startup companies if they were trying to get a product off the ground um, using this space. Um, one other uh, example in this category that's a little bit different, but um, we thought was really interesting. Um, in 2013, uh, the UT Medical Branch in Galveston started a maker nurse uh, program um, after noticing that nurses were really very innovative in their approach to problem solving. Um, and one of the more famous examples of this is that the IV guard, um, which you see there on the right, was developed after um, someone noticed that nurses were using plastic cups to hold IVs um, in place back in the day. Um, so this maker nurse program, just one example of a, a project that came out of that um, on the left-hand side here, um, this is a solution for um, burn bath victims uh, that this particular nurse um, kind of hacked together, if you will. So uh, previously, um, burn victims um, uh, you know, there's a requirement that water would be run over the burn um, continuously to kind of clean out the damaged area. And previously, um, burn victims would be kind of propped up in this larger shower and periodically repositioned so that the, the stream of water could hit all the key areas, kind of depending on uh, the severity and the extent of the burn. But this nurse uh, rigged up a system that allowed uh, patients to lay down a little bit more comfortably, and the PVC pipe um, with the adjustable nozzles here really allows the water distribution to be customized to suit that person um, rather than repositioning the person um, under that unmovable shower head. So just one interesting example um, of a project that came out of that type of maker space. All right, so our last type here um, is maybe a little bit different than the previous three and less, less expected, um, but it is often labeled as a makerspace. So we thought it was really important to include to kind of help guide conversations and expectations. So that is a co-working and incubator space. You might not see a product that you can actually touch and feel here like you did in the previous three. Um, co-working spaces, as I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, are more like a makerspace of ideas where people can come together in an environment, foster collaboration, creativity, and innovation. Um, so they can either house really small startup companies that are you know, only a couple people or even just a touchdown space for um, a single person working remotely. Um, so we kind of, as designers, need to think about what kind of space encourages the making of ideas. Um, the term incubator space as well is um, sometimes referred to as a maker space, but more focused on the ideation stage of the design process um, where it might be taken to a maker space, um, more like the previous three that we described after the ideation phase. Um, so this type is less common in K-12 and more common in higher ed and public spaces. And similar to an industrial maker space that Gwen was just describing, there could um, be office hours or rentable office space, which would need to be considered um, as part of that design as well. So one of the spaces that we toured that falls into this category is um, actually in the Merchandise Mart. And you know, Neocon isn't happening this year, but if, if you are able to make it next year, um, we would suggest checking this one out. Um, it's uh, an interesting co-working space kind of tucked 
in all of the showroom um, areas. Uh, so it offers a multitude of different settings and furniture arrangements. So each person can choose the setting that best works for them. They had options like treadmill desks and bean bags and small huddle rooms, phone booths. Um, so different areas for smaller meetings that are more private. Um, also, we found with these types, um, you almost always see them paired with a coffee shop or a restaurant, um, cafe kind of of some sort, um, which this one um, in the Merchandise Mart had as well. Um, similarly, um, this is one that our team toured in California called the, the Hannah House, um, which was originally the Varsity Theater, um, which was built in the 1920s and um, was kind of that, that central hub for community and conversation for about 50 years um, before it was converted into a bookstore. And then it was vacant um, for several years um, before the Hannah House came in and revitalized this landmark building. Um, to be a, a cafe and workspace to kind of attract the innovators in the area. Um, so they had a few workspace options to choose from. They had open seating, lounge seating, and conference rooms that were all bookable by the hour to give you the freedom and flexibility to reserve um, the space how you needed it. Um, and they also did include a coffee shop and an event space. Um, similar to the Hannah House, as I'm sure we're all familiar with WeWork, um, where their core mission is to create a collaborative community where entrepreneurs and small businesses can interact and exchange ideas. Um, so to support this goal, the design had a lot of glass front offices, um, benching, desking, uh, community areas, including soft seating, conference rooms. Uh, they had lounges, game areas, coffee bars, pantries, and even beer carts on site. This example is a little different than the previous two, um, but it still supports that incubator model. Um, so the Trinity Groves Restaurant Incubator in Dallas, um, it fosters growth of concepts and startups and encourages um, chefs to kind of create and present concepts to experienced restaurant owners who can then support them. So it kind of serves as like a launch pad for people with ideas um, for new restaurants to get a start um, and then support that collaborative community model of a co-working and incubator culture. Now we're gonna do a little bit more of a deep dive and I'll pass it over to Gwen. So the types of maker spaces that we just shared with you, uh, these four types kind of summarize kind of four different directions that you could take with a maker space that we saw during the benchmarking trips that we took. And uh, what we'd now like to share briefly with you is something um, hot off the press that demonstrates uh, kind of the current status of maker uh, culture. Um, and then we'll conclude by sharing um, some predictions about uh, maker spaces of the future. Um, Highland Park ISD is a small district in Dallas, Texas. Um, the community is fairly small um, and contains a number of successful businessmen and women um, and students here are generally pretty high achieving. Um, they perform quite well on standardized tests. Um, the four-year graduation rate is over 99%. Um, and this is their high school building, um, which is housed in this uh, really beautiful 1920s building that's been added on to uh, many times over the years. Um, so you might think that you know, this school is successful and it, therefore there's really no need for innovation. Um, but the leadership disagreed and wanted to have a way for students um, not just to make good grades and kind of check off those boxes, but to really be engaged in their educational experience. So they applied for um, and were awarded a grant through the uh, Moody Innovation Institute um, for STEAM and STEM spaces. So specifically, um, after doing a poll of uh, the student population to kind of see what kind of programs they would be interested in, um, they selected two new programs for the school, um, engineering design and uh, business entrepreneurialism, both of which um, were to be supported by a makerspace. So um, what we knew as the design team going in um, right off is that this was going to be um, a very different uh, type of makerspace from what we um, had looked at previously and that it was supporting um, much more uh, professional um, kind of business driven um, programs. So in some ways it was kind of a combination of uh, the co-working or incubator space that Ali just shared 
um, but also about um, tangible items, robotics and so on. So in that sense, it was a little bit more like a fabrication lab. But on top of these layers of functionality, um, it really needed to have this very professional, uh, business-like aesthetic um, to blend in with the community's expectations. Um, in the most uh, recent addition uh, to the building, I mentioned there have been several over the years, um, the district had shelled out the third floor um, of that particular addition as it wasn't quite needed yet, but it was anticipated as being needed for the future. Um, and so the MAPS program, um, as this came to be called, the Moody Advanced Professional Studies Program, uh, moved into part of that shelled space. So the plan includes, um, let's see if I can get a pointer to work here. Looks like not today. Um, over on the right-hand side, um, there's two larger uh, classroom spaces, one for each program, and they both open onto um, this large centralized maker space, which is the big open space you see there um, in the middle. And so supporting these uh, really key program components, we also have a couple of offices um, up at the top of the plan there. Um, and then uh, near the bottom, uh, we have a conference room that is um, for pr presentations to the business community. Um, as well as a small breakout space. Um, and there's room over on the left-hand side of the plan um, for future growth if they end up adding additional programs um, beyond the two that they are initially um, piloting. So when you reach uh, the third floor of this building, this is kind of your first glimpse into the MAPS program. Um, one thing that was really key to the design um, was the desire for this space to stand out from the rest of the school. Um, which, if you recall from the, the image of the front of the building, was a very traditional building um, with quite a rich history. Um, so here, there was a deliberate effort to um, take a separate approach to branding um, that was very intentional. Um, so environmental graphics were really key um, in expressing that something special was happening in this part of the building. Um, so we have um, a wall here that kind of announces the name of the program when you first come in, uh, but we also wanted to make it functional, offering places to sit, um, a screen for collaboration, a tackable surface, um, and so on. Moving a little further in, um, we reach the breakout uh, collaboration space, um, which is meant to imitate more of a modern workplace environment um, with furniture that's really enabling those casual um, interactions after hours. And then the space opens up to the maker space, which you see here. Um, the walls with blue glass in the back are those two classrooms I mentioned that have that immediate adjacency um, to the maker space. And the maker space itself um, has tables of various heights. Um, it has mobile storage pieces, um, as well as a few pieces of fixed millwork. Um, and these really offer um, some additional storage and also home for some of the equipment that's more permanently available um, and power access for that equipment. Um, we also have a sink um, in the space just off to the left. Uh, here's a quick peek inside the classrooms, um, which have uh, very flexible furniture um, and quite a bit of uh, built-in storage for uh, supplies and materials. And this is the professional conference room where students can meet together um, or make presentations to uh, business community members who are an active part um, of the educational program. So this uh, facility has been open since October, um, but students have already um, engaged in a number of different design to fabrication experiences uh, with creative technologies, like building uh, remotely operated cars um, and robots. They also um, have really invited the business community in to participate in their program. So this photo is showing um, that same makerspace that we shared earlier, but you can see that it's actually flexible enough to be completely repurposed um, to be used as kind of a tiered lecture space for presentations or guest speakers. Um, and that's actually achieved primarily through just different seating heights um, that are available in the space when you move out those tables. So this project is our, our most current example of makerspaces today. Um, and we'd like to conclude by just taking a, a quick peek into the future um, about what we might expect uh, down the road from makerspaces.
All right, so what's next? Um, so as with many things, it often helps to zoom out and kind of look at the bigger picture and see where things are going. So aside of um, where they are today, kind of what are the next generation's experiences going to be in making? Um, I think the biggest question is really what new space types will today's students demand of their workplace? Um, so how can we kind of help shape that? So we need to, to figure out where they're going. We need to examine the forces on our culture and our society that drive change to figure out how maker spaces might adapt. So our group kind of identified a cycle similar to the age old chicken and egg concept uh, where both innovation and space design can begin this, this change cycle. So we would prefer that innovation drive so that we can properly design spaces. Um, and to give you an example of innovation as the driver, we can use the Trinity Groves restaurant concept that we described earlier, where there was the innovative idea of giving a restaurant startup more support, which then led to re resource needs, which then um, ultimately a space was needed for chefs to test and present their concepts and serve their patrons which then led to behavioral change of the patrons who seek out fresh and new restaurant concepts at that location, as well as more accessibility and support for new chefs, and they kind of know where to go for that. Um, in an educational setting, sometimes a makerspace uh, will be a part of the program, but without necessarily a curriculum that feeds into one. So that's an example of a space type as the instigator of the cycle. Um, so that leads to behavioral change because the, the students and teachers um, will start to integrate the usage of that space into their projects, which will hopefully then spur on innovation and expand their desires for what they need. They'll kind of figure out what they what they like and what they want, um, which will hopefully then be able to create more maker resources for the community. So as designers, we need to stay ahead of the progression of what maker spaces might become so that we can shape our spaces accordingly. So we want to leave you with some final thought provoking questions to think about just the future of maker spaces and where it's going. So the first is the potential for an emergence of new space types. So how will 21st century students shape demands on the workplace? Um, are we going to start seeing virtual reality rooms more common um, as VR has really taken off? Um, there's products like the Oculus Medium um, where, where you can use handheld controllers to virtually make products. Um, so are we going to need to create spaces that support that type of software more? Um, so maybe it's an immersive environment that allows a small group to participate in making together um, and present ideas to each other um, rather than a single person on a headset um, just to, to create a little bit more inclusion. Uh, we've also seen a wave of innovation from startups and a need to support them. And startups need resources uh, really that relieve the financial burden early on. So we think we might see an increase in more public shared maker spaces um, or even facilities opening up to the public um, that maybe previously weren't. Um, so like K-12 or higher ed. Um, so also, we, we kind of live in this accelerated culture of sharing um, with companies like Uber and Airbnb and Instacart, uh, which I think um, a lot of us are probably used or familiar with. So sharing makerspace resources will likely become more embraced and accessible as well. And kind of with these blurred lines of living, live, work and play, um, we need to think about how we need to change spaces to kind of decentralize and support people who either work in those industries or who use those industries and, uh, and kind of like that model. Um, we also think we'll see an increase in entrepreneurship due to how accessible they've become. So there are forums like Etsy and eBay where people can turn their creations into cash. Um, so we have also thought about the fact that we might see more physical maker spaces that will start to attach more on-site retail spaces um, in the future to help support local makers rather than having it um, all just online. Um, and finally, we, we wanted to address the effect that our current pandemic might have on maker spaces. So if we, if we do see an increase in the remote workforce, as some are predicting, um, will we see a rise in more mobile maker space options, like the Discovery Lab van example that Gwen mentioned earlier? And as we transition 
um, back out of this and back um, into our normal environments. Um, will maker spaces be open, but with reduced occupancy rules or extended hours? Um, potentially, they'll adapt to allow digital um, transfer of designs to a maker space, and there will be perhaps a person on site um, who can actually do the um, running of the machinery, and then maybe it'll be kind of a, a curbside or drive-through pickup um, of your prototype rather than you being there and physically um, running the equipment yourself. So these are all things that um, we think as designers we need to stay ahead of and be prepared for as our clients are kind of adapting in this changing world. So we hope that this has been helpful and that we've been able to put into perspective the various types of maker spaces as well as uh, where they originated and the ways that we anticipate them adapting to our changing culture. So I think now we're ready to address any questions. It looks like we had um, a couple of questions and comments um, trickle in while we were talking. So we'll start there. And if um, you guys want to type any more in um, while we're wrapping up, that, that would be great. Um, there, uh, we have a, a comment here or a question around um, when we were speaking earlier about the history of maker spaces, um, someone pointed out that there was also a very influential um, maker fair in San Francisco in 2006, um, which, yes, great reminder, was also a really important part of setting this trend. So a lot of things were kind of coming together around that same period of time, um, and that's an important one to mention also. Um, let's see here. Um, we had a question about um, acoustical separation for maker spaces um, and whether or not um, you know that influenced the placement of the maker space within the school um, or if there were special treatments for consideration. Um, and I, I think we definitely saw some of that in our in our benchmarking. Um, definitely for those more industrial manufacturing spaces, those absolutely required <laughs> um, pretty intense um, acoustical separation um, because the machines are so so large and so loud. Um, I think within a more typical K-12 environment, we often would see these spaces um, grouped down by um, you know, your dining room or your gymnasium, um, sometimes a little bit closer to other programs that also have a little bit of noise associated with them. Um, but, you know, in other cases, um, if we're looking at more of a discovery lab type, like you might see in an elementary school, um, it would be more common to see something uh, kind of like a converted art space um, that might not necessarily need the acoustic separation just because the, the equipment isn't very robust or very loud. So definitely always a consideration, but um, treated in different ways um, depending on the, um, the application. Uh, let me scroll down here. Um, there is a comment here around um, maker spaces and libraries and um, integrating those into library spaces versus the space being used for uh, books. Um, and you know the the project uh, referenced in this question is the Pew Library, which I think is probably the most extreme example that we saw. Um, that was a, a new building where they chose to actually, um, you know, put all of the books into a consolidated space and have them retrieved by robots uh, so that uh, the rest of the space could be used for something else, um, including, among other things, a small maker space. Um, I would say that's probably a little bit more rare um, compared to what we would typically see. Um, but there, there are some people that um, are interested in, in that kind of total replacement of the book. I think what was a lot more common was to um, keep a lot of those physical resources there um, and repurpose areas like the traditional computer lab, um, which a lot of people have found to be not quite as effective as it maybe was um, in the past. So we saw a, a wide range of responses um, from clients and from the maker spaces that we toured. Um, but I would say that the, the Pew Library example was kind of on the extreme end of concealing all of the books. Um, scroll down here a little bit further. Or Allie, jump in if you see one. Sure. Yeah, so it looks like the next one is, have we heard of a school system considering 
creating a mobile makerspace classroom that could travel to different schools and be designed to be attached for a period of time. Um, the advantage is accessibility, security can be designed in, but it requires us having measure in place for the design of the prototype. That's a really good point. Um, I don't know that I've personally seen a K-12 school that had a, a mobile makerspace that could attach to the facility. I don't know if you have, Gwen. I haven't either. Um, you know, we shared that Stratasys example of the bus that kind of travels around. That was not tied to a school district, though. Um, and of course, we saw those little maker carts that go from classroom to classroom within a school. Um, but not something that travels between buildings. So that's a really interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be something we see more of in the future. Um, so it looks like the next one is, in a school, how much space would you provide for student project storage that takes multiple weeks? Is this near the maker space or at their general classroom? Um, I'd say um, it depends on the level of schooling first. Um, so if it's an elementary school, um, sometimes it will be more like a discovery lab where it might just be a part of um, their their kind of home classroom. Um, but if it is a, a middle school or high school level um, or higher ed, a lot of times that will be a dedicated, um, the storage will be dedicated in that maker space or in an adjacent room that connects to the maker space. Um, and it, it kind of depends on the, the types of scale of projects. You know, a high school might be doing a lot more robust kind of like robotics and construction um, type projects that will require storage of two by fours and sheet metal. Um, whereas as the lower grade levels, um, it might just be more things like pipe cleaners and cotton balls um, that, that can just be kind of housed in um, just tr traditional casework or cubbies with bins. Um, so that's kind of, I'd say, get, get a lot of information from the client, I guess, would be my thought on that one. Um, it looks like we have a question here about whether in elementary schools, if we've seen um, Maker spaces more commonly associated with the, the library or with the art room. Um, I, I think I personally have seen both. I would say probably more commonly in the in the library, but um, but certainly we have a couple of examples where the art room was really more of that space. Ali, have you seen more of one than the other? Yeah, I think the library. Yeah, I think the, the library area tends to be more of that, um, that community commons hub that oftentimes it kind of makes sense um, as a shared resource, um, where the art room tends to be a little bit more scheduled, potentially. Looks like our last question is about um, whether we've conducted post-occupancy surveys um, related to makerspaces. Um, and uh, whether we're tying them to being successfully supported by experienced support staff, material resupply, so kind of some of the logistics in additional, addition to those design components. Um, and our, our research and benchmarking team has not um, done post-occupancy surveys on that particular topic, but that would be, um, that would certainly be interesting to see. When we did our benchmarking, um, we did have a list of very specific questions that we asked folks about makerspaces. Um, that had been in operation for quite some time. So in that sense, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a uh, post-occupancy survey, um, and, but we shared some of that with you today. We have not done a, a formal kind of distributed by email survey, no. And then it looks like we just got one more question um, in the floor surfaces that best hold up. Um, oftentimes I've seen the most success with uh, polished concrete um, or even sealed concrete um, just because of, of all of the heavy equipment and um, students, especially with materials and building. Would you agree, Gwen? I would. I would say concrete is probably what I've seen uh, most often as well. Definitely a hard surface flooring that's, that's easy to clean. <laughs> yes. Well, if that was all the questions, we finally just wanted to plug our upcoming webinars with our colleagues who will be hosting 
um, these webinars in partnership with A4LE. So we hope that you can join these as well. And we just thank you for your time today. If we don't, oh, looks like we had a couple more questions pop up. How long did the benchmarking process take and how was it funded? That's a good question. Uh, Gwen, do you want to actually take that on you? Sure. Yeah. You um, I, I would say that the time that we left for the actual uh, tours themselves took place over about a year. Um, obviously, there was some planning on the front end and some assembly of information on the back end, but um, we gave ourselves about that much time to, um, to do the traveling and the tours. Um, and it, it was funded by Stantec. Um, we feel that this research and benchmarking uh, program really helps us find kind of the best practices um, and the brightest ideas that helps make our projects better. Um, so we are willing to uh, financially support that. Um, and then there's a last question here about ceiling types that are most common. Um, and I would say um, in most of the ones that I have seen, with the exception of kind of the co-working spaces, I think we've oftentimes left the ceilings exposed, actually. Um, mm -hmm. It offers a lot of flexibility for the future. It helps with, um, you know, bringing cord reels down so that you have flexible power and connections. Um, so I'd say most commonly there's actually no ceiling. All right, I think that was the last question. <laughs> so thank yes, you again thank you, everyone. Um, for um, attending today. Um, it, was, it was good to have this discussion with you all and great questions. Um, thank you. OK. Um, so that's going to conclude our session. I want to thank Gwen and Allison for sharing their expertise with us today and all of our registrants for attending today's program. Your certificate of attendance and evaluation form will be emailed to you within the next 24 hours, and we ask that you take a moment to provide us with your thoughts on today's program. You can get registered for all of our upcoming live webinars as well as on-demand recordings of previous programs at education.a4le.org. Thanks again for joining us, and have a wonderful